Good morning, church. Morning. The candle's lit. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Bethany Bruder, our director of women's ministry, had a privilege of praying with Taylor, her former neighbor, and leading her to Christ this week. Let's celebrate with Taylor. <clears throat> I am so thankful to be a part of a church family uh, who has a heart for the harvest. And uh, as a church, we'd have to go all the way back to early, mid-July, uh, 17 weeks ago, since we did not light the candle uh, either a new, for a new salvation or a new baptism. And God is at work. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he probably deserves a better one than that, doesn't he? God is at work. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, in a lot of ways, we have absolutely nothing to do with that because he is the one who saves. He's the one who can't save. But at the same time, it's because he works through you and you've got a heart for the harvest. So thank you. I'm so proud of you. Uh, our annual men's event that we call State of the man is this Friday night, guys. And uh, it's something, yeah, you don't want to miss it. Once a year, we call out all men to come together uh, to challenge, to encourage, uh, to spur one another on. And I am so excited to see you there. There's no cost. There's some good chili. In fact, there's a, there's a competition, I guess. So. Hey, we've been tracking through the book of Romans. And I just want to pause and say, Thank you, Pastor Matt, for beautifully opening the scriptures to us. Oh, man. We went with a leading of the Holy Spirit here in October, and he, he had the bulk of it. And what an amazing gifted teacher. Uh, we are so blessed. And we are the recipients of that, aren't we? So I'm thankful. Let's, let me start with a question here on the Romans uh, 14. How well do you do with people who you disagree with? <laughs> do you find yourself eventually just not talking to them? I mean, are there family members that you've stopped inviting to certain events because you just don't like the way the conversation ends up going? Are there family members that you've completely stopped speaking to? Well, Romans 14 addresses that. And the church in Rome was made up of a, a very diverse group, people from different cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds. Uh, had a large number of Jewish Christians who'd been raised with century-old practices, and uh, which made kind of an awkward because many of those old practices were no longer under a, a new covenant and, and everybody else knew it but them. <laughs> uh, so they were having to unlearn what some of the non-essentials were under this newfound grace-filled walk with the Lord in Christ. Jesus came to free us, you know? But some of them were still struggling with leaving behind some of the old rigid uh, suffocating rituals and some of just downright legalism, you know? Um, the church at that time was also made up of a large number of new Gentile Christ Christians. And they, they were, their background was kind of just pagan, you know? They had come from what you call a, a polytheistic uh, background where they worshiped many gods. Uh, they were used to living this very liberal do whatever you please, it feels good, kind of a lifestyle. And, and so following Christ and living a pure and holy life that honors the Lord, this was all new to them, you know? And so it takes time uh, to grow in our faith and the Holy Spirit to work and show us things. And Now you put those two very diverse and large groups together, different backgrounds, sparks are gonna fly, right? And they did, they did in that church in Rome. And the apostle Paul caught wind of how 
they were bickering and quarreling and how the church was divided. And, and here was a challenge. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be known for their love for one another, right? The church is, is supposed to be known for their love for fellow believers and how they treat one another. Jesus said, a lost world ought to be able to look at the church and how we treat one another and how unified we are and know that we are Christians by our love. But that wasn't happening in this church, in the early church here in Rome. So chapter 14 in the first half of 15, where we're going today, are one extended discussion about how to get along with people in the church that see things differently than you do, all right? And it's interesting that they were united mostly on major doctrinal issues. They were, they were in agreement on the essentials. You say, well, pastor, what are the essentials? Well, the essentials are the foundational beliefs and truths of the Christian faith, okay? In healthy churches today, we'd call those our statement of faith. Uh, they were united in the essential beliefs of Christianity. We used to sing a song around here called Creed, and it, it just went through all these foundational doctrinal beliefs that we, we all agree on, we must agree on. They, they believe that there's one God eternally existing, three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they believed that, you know, they believed and agreed on, on the Bible that it was the inspired and authoritative word of God without error. They believed in the deity of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection from the grave. They believed in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, that the Holy Spirit indwells inside of every believer, enabling us to live godly lives when we surrender ourselves uh, completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They agreed on that. They, they agreed that we'd all sinned and, and that our sin has alienated us from uh, a holy God and that the only way to bridge that gap the only, is only through faith in Christ and Christ alone that we can be saved. And see, what I just shared with you right there, that's the core essentials of the Christian faith, all right? Uh, they are what we would call the non-negotiables, <laughs> all right? Uh, as, as Christ followers, we have now come under the authority of the scriptures. And these are black and whites. And uh, with these beliefs, there's no wiggle room for, for different interpretations or scriptures of what we just shared there. Although they're not the only black and whites in scripture, they are without question the major ones. And which is why uh, this belief in relativism is not compatible with Christianity. Relativism is, is the belief that there, there are no absolute truths. Uh, we have, have you ever thought about how ignorant that statement is? I mean, when someone says there's no absolute truth, I wanna ask, well, are you absolutely sure about that? Because in just saying that, you just shot yourself in the foot, you know? So, um, the neat thing about our core beliefs in Christianity is that they, they are what unites us as believers if we'll continue to major on the major, that, you know, those core beliefs, like our statement of faith, and not on the minors and these beliefs and practices that are open to interpretation. And scholars look at them and they don't even agree. It's kind of like, well, he may be saying this, he may be saying that. But these core beliefs serve as a foundational guide for us to go by and should never, if we ever begin to drift from these core doctrinal truths that I just mentioned, blaring alarms should go off. Yeah, because that's how cults get started. It's like, well, hey, let's start playing with, you know, the Apostles' Creed here, you know? So, uh, but for the most part, this church in Rome was in agreement on the main essentials. Where they got off track is when they began quarreling over the non-essentials, all right? Romans 4.1, Paul says this to them, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters, disputable matters. 
is what they were divided on. You say, well, Pastor, what, is, what are disputable matters? Well, disputable matters are what we call secondary issues. And when I start bringing up some of these disputable matters, it's going to offend some of you because I even put it in a secondary column. But their beliefs and practices that are open to interpretation. They're the gray areas in which the Bible does not spell out clear guidelines, but, we're, but yet some of us were really passionate about some of these, you know. And it's not that they're not important, it's just that they are secondary. Uh, they're not on the same level as the core beliefs. They're not, they're not on the same level as a, as a salvation issue. Are you with me? So let me give you some examples. I mean, ob- the most obvious one is what you don't want to talk about around your Thanksgiving table, and that's politics, right? <laughs> uh, and is that on anybody's mind this week? Whoa. I mean, here it is, November, election time, the gloves are off. And we're to be different. The church is to be different than the world on this. I mean, the, the, the nation is so divided. And some of us have some very strong opinions about which political party we should vote for, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Which candidate would be the best candidate? And that's okay because it is important. And we should be involved. And we should vote. And my wife and I stood in line for uh, at least an hour. And I was thankful that I had to stand in line for an hour. I was like, hey, people care around here, you know? So, but here's the deal. It's still, in script, it's a secondary issue. I mean, you study God's word. You, you'll not come across a single scripture that says politics and government is, was the primary concern of the kingdom of God and of Jesus. Should we care? Yes. We should, but what political party will win is not the primary concern for the kingdom of God, all right? Whoever wins the election, like Cody just mentioned, is not our savior, all right? And as Christ followers, we cannot let keep us from our primary mission that the Lord has given us, okay? And I know uh, that's a tension for some of us because we've elevated that to almost a, you know, a core belief, you know? So, um, disputable matters. Another example would be, hey, we just came out of Halloween, right? And there are some Christians who take a firm stand on whether or not they allow their kids to celebrate Halloween. Another example would be that of uh, social drinking, of drinking alcohol. Those of you who have come out of an unchurched background, like a Gentile Christian, a new one, you're going, was that really a thing? <laughs> you know, and so, is that really a thing in some churches? Uh, and it can be, it can become very divisive if, it's, if those things are elevated to a place where God never intended them, us for, to take them. You know, it's kind of like, well, everyone needs to have the same conviction as me or you're just not as good a Christian, you know? Or if you don't believe like me, you're just not as spiritual, you know? So you see how quickly this thing can all go south concerning disputable matters. And that's what happened in the church here in Rome. Uh, another another uh, example of disputable matters is the way that Christian parents choose to educate their children. Some of us uh, in this um, church family, we have some strong opinions on that. And there's nothing wrong with having strong opinions on that. It's good that you have convictions. But some parents would say, oh, homeschooling is the only way to go. Others would say, no, private Christian school, that's that's where we send our, we feel like that's best. And then there are others who would say, a third would say, no, we believe our kids need to learn to live out their faith in the real world. So we're going to send our kids to public school. And none of them are, are wrong. I mean, this is, this is a silent issue in the scriptures. This is a disputable matter. You know, uh, every parent needs to decide for themselves. And where we get off is that everybody doesn't stay in their lane. You feel like, well, hey, if you don't do it like me, then you got to look down on that. You know, that's not... So... Um, Theologian John Wesley summarized 
pretty well how we should deal with disputable matters when he said this quote. And I really think he got it from somewhere else, but he, this is what he was known for saying. He said, quote, in essential things, let us have unity. In non-essential things, liberty. In all things, charity. And so if you're following along when you're teaching notes this morning, here's how I'd put it. Number one, in essentials, unity. Those core beliefs, the foundations of our faith, uh, truths of our faith, our statement of faith, in essentials, unity. Number two, in non-essentials, liberty. In these disputable matters that Paul's talking about, you know, uh, everyone should form their own opinions and convictions. You have the Holy Spirit, he'll show you. And number three, in all things, love. In all things, love, because you can be right and still be wrong. You can be right and still be wrong. Uh, remember what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, what we covered, that as a church family, we're to live in harmony with one another. And our text today explains how to do that. Even when you disagree on things you're passionate about with other believers, all right? Uh, go back to verse one. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Talking about disputable matters, not, not, not core beliefs. Uh, we need to stand firm on core beliefs and there's no wiggle room. And now Paul addresses a couple disputable matters where uh, what they were dealing with in the early church. Number one, uh, verse two, for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer uh, with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are we, or who are you, uh, to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. So you, you may ask, well, what in the world is going on here? Why was eating meat a disputable matter a couple thousand years ago in, in the early church. Well, in the city of Rome, Rome was filled with pagan temples at the time. And most everyone who was not a Christian at that time in culture was, was an idol worshiper, all right? And they, would, they, they were worshiping false gods. And they were, there was leftover meat that had been sacrificed to idols that was sold at the marketplace at a discount price when they didn't use the meat, you know? And so it was good meat. I mean, in fact, it was the best cut. I mean, he, they may have been worshiping false idols, but they still understood that we're to, we're to bring our very best to God when coming to worship. And the people brought their best cut of meat to sacrifice on the altar. And, but the Gentile Christians were, they were purchasing this and they were taking it home and eating it, all right? And they were like, why would anyone throw away good meat? You know? But the Jewish Christians were like, whoa, this meat has been offered to an idol. It's permanently tainted. And so the Jewish Christians refused to, to buy it, bring it home and eat it. They were only eating vegetables, all right? But the Gentile Christians were like, that's crazy. Paul said that Jesus' death had cleansed all things for us, so pass the bacon. Here in verse five, Paul brings up a second disputable matter. What specific day should we be practicing and honoring the Sabbath? In verse five, he says, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than the, another day, while others think the other day is uh, alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. So the Jewish Christians were thinking, man, Saturday is the day, the Sabbath day to worship on. Because they had been, this had been a big deal for them for 1,500 years. I mean, this is how they grew up. 
And a lot of, a lot of our convictions and opinions about things happen on how we grow up. You know, that, we form those and uh, we don't even realize that's, well, that's just how I grew up. But the Gentile Christians were like, don't you realize that that's Old Testament, like, under the Old Testament covenant law? Jesus has completely released us of that. And of course, today, we've chosen to participate to corporate worship on Sunday because that's the day of Jesus' resurrection. So what's the biblical way to deal with this, to deal with disputable matters? How should we respond to these secondary issues, which we're, we're often very, very passionate about, very opinionated about, and which we sometimes disagree with other Christians about. Well, Paul says, number one in your outline, he just comes out and says it right away. You need to be accepting. You need to be accepting. Let's go back to verse one. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. He's talking about disputable matters here, not core truths of the gospel. Now, if you're like me, when you read the word accept, you're thinking, okay, I just need to be tolerant here. I, you know, on these matters that, that dispute, I, I don't like it. It doesn't feel right, but I got to swallow it, uh, even though I think it's wrong, and, and, but I'll accept it. But that's not what Paul's saying here. The word accept in the Greek is a, quote, an open-armed embrace. It's usually associated in the New Testament with hospitality. It's opening your home and honoring somebody. It's in the present perfect tense, meaning it's not just a one-time thing, all right? It's walking arm in arm. Here it is. If you want to see a picture of it, it's walking arm in arm, even when you don't see eye to eye with somebody. That's a picture of acceptance. And it's about doing life with someone, even though there's this significant disagreement over something that's important to you, that you're passionate about, you have strong convictions about, but they don't agree. But you can still walk arm in arm. Got that picture? That's what Paul says. This is how the church looks different than the world. And so it's the homeschool mom. They're not just hanging out with other homeschool moms and causing this little click, but they're including private school moms in their life too, and public school moms in the inner circle. And that, that goes two ways. Actually, it goes three ways in that example, right? So verse three says, God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Paul's saying, don't be so judgy. And some of you are thinking, is that a word? You're, you got some strong opinions about that, right? I don't know about judgy. No. Uh, well, don't be so judgy. Learn to stay in your lane when it comes to disputable matters. In fact, you ought to go the extra mile and give, give them an open embrace is what Paul is saying here. These are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Learn to walk arm in arm with them even though you don't see, the, see eye in eye, eye to eye. Number two, when it comes to disputable matters, Paul is saying, be thoughtful, be thoughtful. When another Christian does not think the, the way that you think concerning a secondary issue, when there's an issue and it looks like it could potentially separate you, Paul says, you know what? You not only need to be accepting, but you need to be thoughtful in a way that you, you protect that relationship and try to keep the unity. In verse 15, he says this, if your brothers and sisters is distressed because of what you eat, and he's talking about disputable matters, whatever that is, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by eating uh, destroy someone from whom Christ died. Whoa, that's one way to put it. So to the Jewish Christians, Paul's like, hey, don't let your strong opinions become an obstacle that gets in the way of other people's spiritual growth, all right? Don't, don't be putting so extra hurdles 
for the new Gentile Christians to have to jump over in order for them to grow in their faith. In other words, don't make it harder for them than it really is. And later on, Paul, Paul's like, hey, that judgmental spirit goes both ways, as you'll see in the coming verses. Even though you Gentiles do not have a conviction about eating meat that's been sacrificed by idols, uh, two idols, if you're having a meal with a Jewish friend and you're a Gentile, you know, and it violates your brother's conscience, don't cause them to stumble. Refrain from eating meat while you're in their presence. When you go home, you can eat all the bacon you want, but refrain, all right? Now, an obvious example of this in our culture would be that of social drinking. The Bible clearly prohibits drunkenness, right? The Bible does not prohibit a glass of wine at a meal or having a beer at a ball game. Now, some of us who grew up in a very, I'd say, uh, I don't even know how to say it because we're conservative, but in a, in a church that's kind of rigid and, and they would they'd say, well, I don't know about that. Well, we have people in both camps here at Brandywine. You might have your own personal conviction to not do that, but the Bible does not prohibit it. Uh, here's why this should never be an issue. The Bible does prohibit us from judging people who see this issue differently. This is a disputable matter. The Bible does prohibit you from making your personal conviction a requirement over someone else to follow, all right? Uh, and Paul even takes this to a whole new level in these next verses. I mean, like hypothetically, let's say you're having dinner tonight with someone who has struggled with alcohol and abusing it, and, and, but now they're sober, all right? Paul would say to you, you need to stop and consider what's best for that person, all right? How's your drinking gonna affect them? Should you yell drinks all around? No, you shouldn't. Should you yourself refrain from drinking at that moment? And, and Paul is like, well, you've got the freedom, but yeah, you probably should refrain. You see, your right to do something doesn't always give you the right to do it. Does that make sense? And you've been given all this freedom. That's why Christ came. And just be sure you exercise that freedom in a God-honoring way. So, um, you know, there are times when we need to be willing to limit our freedom on whatever the topic of uh, disputable matters would be. Uh, not out of legalism, but out of love for that other person. Not out of just some rule to follow, but out of being thoughtful to that one that you're hanging out with that may be struggling with something. Because you can be right and still be wrong, right? And especially when it comes to disputable matters where you, things that you're very passionate about and opinionated about, all right? Number three, a third way to deal with disputable matters as Christ followers is we are to be united. Unity, this is what Jesus prayed for in the garden. More than anything else, he could have prayed for anything. What did he pray for? That my church the people in the church would be one as me and the Father are one. Paul says we need to make every effort to keep the peace in order that we'd be united as a church family. And here's what a whole lot of folks don't get. They don't understand that unity does not happen because we all agree, all right? Unity happens because we accept in that definition that Paul gave, all right? Uh, we can agree to disagree, but still walk arm in arm. There's something within us that thinks, if you'll just agree with me, we'll be in unity, all right? Uh, so I'm gonna keep beating you over the head with my stick of my opinions until you think like me. And then we'll be in unity. That's not unity. And that, that's a problem. Paul says we don't need to all agree on everything. We need to major on the major, not on the minor. And, and when it comes to these secondary issues, we do need to be accepting, we need to be thoughtful, and we need to be united and think of other 
the other person before ourselves, is what Paul says in verse 19. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Um, don't tear apart the work of the God over what you eat, over a disputable matter. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. Verse 21, it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. I love Paul's advice on this next verse. He says, quote, so whatever you believe in these disputable matters about these things, keep between yourself and God. <laughs> we all have opinions, right? And uh, some of us have strong opinions. And oftentimes we feel like we need to share that opinion no matter what, even at the expense of causing more harm than good. You need to know my opinion. Uh, I love how Eugene Peterson puts uh, Romans 14 in a paraphrase. Uh, a paraphrase is just one man's interpretation of scripture. And he says this, welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it seems that they are strong on opinions, but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. Isn't that a beautiful way to say it? And, and here at Brandywine, this is how we would say it. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. And we don't have to say more or less than what the Bible says when it comes to disputable matters. And it's not that we're afraid to address them. We address about everything. I mean, over the last 33 years, I can't think of a topic we have not addressed. And, and, but we, we're not afraid. It's the reason we don't address disputable matters and take a side is because biblically, it's not right to do that. Paul just comes out, I mean, and says it. Now, some of you in the past might have been a part of a church that would address disputable matters and really take a side. And maybe they, that church elevated that disputable matter to where it was a, a core part of their identity. I mean, it kind of became, that's who they are. You know, that's what they're known for. So you've, you've come here at Brandywine and we don't do that. We don't address disputable matters unless it's just like, well, this is something that's just gotta be talked about. And here's why. Paul flat out says it's wrong to elevate an issue like that, a disputable matter to an inappropriate point of attention where they actually become divisive in the church. We don't want that. And so we work hard at doing that as your pastors and leaders and elders our goal is not to try to get everybody to agree on a hundred different things. That's not our goal, you know? Our goal is Romans chapter one through 13, or through 12. And we talked about, these are the core truths of the, uh, of the gospel. Let's say, let's say you brought your unchurched friend here today and you've been praying for that unchurched friend for years. And today, they showed up with you, all right? And when you arrived here at church this morning, let's say, let's say we, hypothetically, you, we had a guest speaker. And that guest speaker just went on a rant, you know? And, and, and it was on disputable manners, uh, matters. Bad manners, but disputable matters. Uh, and they began expressing very strong opinions on some things that are secondary issues, you know, and to your horror, they're up there and they're, they're up here going, you can't be a Christian if you vote for, all right? Uh, the presidential candidate, you can't vote for them. They're a jerk or they're too liberal or whatever. And maybe they go on another rant. You can't be a good Christian if you let your kids dress up like Godzilla and go get candy next door, you know? Or, or he goes on another rant. A good Christian would never send their kid to a public school where they just, they're gonna teach him that they're originated from a monkey, 
You know, in other words, if you don't educate the way I educate, if you don't vote the way I vote, if you don't interpret scriptures, these disputable matters, the way I interpret them, then you're not really a good Christian. And I don't even know if we can be on the same team. Now, if somebody puts a clip of me this week, that's the only clip I'm going to get, right? And they're going to leave out, oh, yeah, that's a disputable matter. No. But it's, it's a, da- let me say this. It's a dangerous thing to start attaching all these extra things to the gospel. And here is our promise to you. As your pastor, if we ever have a guest speaker that goes off like that, I'll be the linebacker. (laughs) I'll run across and take him out, all right? (laughs) Because I love you and I love the gospel. And I always want this to be a safe place. We have seen thousands, literally over 33 years, we've seen thousands of people come to Christ in our services. And that will continue if it remains to be a place. And, and you know what? We need to be a safe place for other believers uh, uh, that don't think like us too, right? On these dis- disputable matters. So number four, when it comes to dealing with disputable matters, number four, be humble. In the book of James, it says, what is it that causes quarreling and division? Isn't it that you don't get what you want? You know, isn't that it? Uh, you, you don't think like I think, therefore you're just wrong. And then the book of Proverbs, is, what, what does it say that causes division and strife in our relationship? It's pride. Check it out. Uh, chapter 13 of Proverbs says, pride leads to conflict. In other words, hey, unless you believe just like I believe, we can't be friends. And we become more focused on pleasing ourselves rather than pleasing that other person. And this is where Paul goes in in chapter 15, as we open chapter 15 of Romans, verse one. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. So Paul said the same thing in Philippians, be humble and give more honor to others than to yourself. Pride tears apart relationships. Are you with me? Pride tears apart relationships. Humility builds them up. Humility doesn't mean you think less of yourself. You've heard me say this. It means thinking of yourself less. We need to think of ourselves less and think of that other person more. All right. In closing, verse 13, I pray that politics, the source of hope. You gonna let me say that? I I pray that what you eat or don't eat, drink or don't, no, it doesn't say that. What does it say? It says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, the gospel is more important than these disputable matters. That's what Paul's saying. When it comes to dealing with these issues uh, that are debatable, and there's nothing wrong with debating on them, it's just some of you take it to a too higher level. You're like, you're like a, uh, I'm keeping my, my son's dog this week, and he's, he's still one year old, and he loves to play, and sometimes he just takes it too far. <laughs> and some of you, you, you take your disputable matters too far. And when it comes to dealing with the, we need to be accepting. We need to be thoughtful of others. We need to be united. We need to be humble. Who are we to judge others? We are to keep secondary issues, secondary issues. Why? Because the gospel is more important. Can we be a church like that for any way? Amen? Our community needs a church like that. And if you said yes in your heart, then some of you need to go home and change your Facebook 
suppose. I'm serious. And some of you who are divided with another Christian over disagreements that are, that are a secondary issue, a non-issue, you need to repent of your sin. Say, God, help me not to elevate this to a place you never meant it to be. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that's our primary mission and importance. Amen? Let's pray. If elders, life group leaders, you can come prepare communion at this time. Father God, thank you for the freedom that you have given us in Jesus Christ to disagree over these disputable matters. And I pray that Brandywine would be a church that is known for its unity. Not because we agree on every issue, but because we are a church where our differences, the world would look at us and see a beautiful testimony of our love for you and our love for one another. God, help us not to get distracted and divided over secondary issues. We can be passionate about it. We can have strong opinions about it. But let us not take it to, let us not take it to a, a, a young puppy dog kind of issue. It should never be, we take it too far. I pray that we would stay lo, laser focused on the mission that you have given us as a church. Preach the gospel, the pure gospel. God, root out any among us who would want to cause disunity and disruption. I pray that you'd change their heart, oh God. Break it. Humble. And God, today we pray for our nation with all of its tension and division. God, would you give us as a church opportunities to demonstrate that our hope is in you? Would you give us opportunities to demonstrate just a supernatural unity that shows the rest of the world what your love looks like? Oh God, do that in our church. Do that in me. Inviting. Thank you, Jesus, that you humbled yourself on a cross to die for our sins. Lord, would you, would you help us to be humble? Humble servants. Not always have it our way to be able to walk arm in arm. Thank you that your body was broken for us. Thank you that your blood was shed on Calvary so that we could live in freedom from our sin. And we just pray blessings over our time of, as we partake in the Lord's Supper. And you said, do this as a remembrance of me. We thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You know, if you prayed a prayer today and you're like, man, I, I need a change and I want a change and you, you may want to further prayer in that over there at our yes table. If you said yes to God, I want to encourage you to stop by. There's a wonderful couple there and our elder and his wife that love to talk to you and pray with you. We practice open communion here at Brandywine and if you are a Christ follower, man, you are welcome to come participate if you can't kneel at the altar, feel free to take the elements back to your seat. Man, the, the, we had a packed house the first service. We ran out of communion. I thought about, it was, it was just an illustration of running, running out of wine. We needed Jesus to do a miracle. But uh, if, if you can't kneel, you can take that back to your seat. As your pastor, I want to tell you, I love you. And I'm so thankful to be a part of this family. The elders open, come and enjoy the presence of the Lord.